Hi, I'd like to welcome all of you back. Uh, this is Archdeacon Mark Solomon, and uh, this is our series on the liturgy here at St. Paul's in Tustin. Uh, let me share my screen with you. Um, we, we are continuing our series on the liturgy. Find it here. Um, but I mean, okay. We are continuing our series on the liturgy, and um, this is the fifth uh, lesson on the liturgy, the fifth talk on the liturgy, and it's the liturgy in the Old Testament relationship. Um, and this is a relationship we might not think of uh, very much when we think about the liturgy itself, and we think, you know, what does the liturgy really have to do with the Old Testament? Um, you know, it's the body of Christ, and it's it's how we move forward, and it's all the things we've talked about in the past. Um, but I think it, it, it it's important for us to just take a step before uh, we get into all of the rituals and all the things that that, that we're going to talk about later, that we talk about the, the connection with the Old Testament and why that's so important. Um, I start with this quote every time, it is needful to understand the miracle of the mysteries, what it is, why it was given, and what is its profit, um, St. John Chrysostom. So we're looking at our schedule, we've talked about the institution, the history, the, lit the theology, and the spirituality, and today we're going to talk about the liturgy and the Old Testament. Um, and that relationship before next few weeks, we get into the priesthood, the church structure, and iconography. All right, so why do we study the liturgy or anything spiritual? Um, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're studying. Uh, once again, it allows us to uh, fully participate with my whole being. So when I am at the liturgy, I get it, and I understand it, and I can participate with it intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, on all the, on all the different dimensions, as well as physically, instead of just being there and waiting for it to be over, uh, I get all the subtlety and all the nuances that's in that liturgy. And this let us, lesson in particular uh, is that the Eucharist was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. And we'll see how clearly it was foreshadowed as part of God's plan for mankind and helps us better understand what the Eucharist is um, when we see that the Old Testament uh, foreshadowed it. Uh, just to some review, um, uh, you know, this, ver this, this, thing that, this verse that we say, do this in remembrance of me. And we talked about this lots of times, the word remembrance, just to review, is the word anamnesis, which means ah, amnesia, uh, which basically means, uh, amnesia means forgetting the past and the present. Ah, amnesis means remembering the past and the present. So when I'm in the liturgy, I'm not just in an event, I'm not remembering an event that happened in the past, but I'm actually in the, the Eucharist, in the, in the Last Supper, and I'm at the Last Supper. And so the Last Supper that we, um, uh, have the when we have the liturgy, it's not just a remembrance of it, but it actually participates in the one and only Last Supper. The priest that we see is not the priest; it's he's representing, and he is in the place of Christ, right? Even to the point where we say in the Gregorian liturgy, "Oh, you who broke, do now break," and then the priest breaks with his hands, and so it is. It's the priest's hands that are breaking, but it's actually Christ who broke. Um, so when I'm at the liturgy, I'm at the Last Supper. I'm at the actual Last Supper. And that's why when we look at these icons uh, of the Last Supper, where am I in this icon? When you look at this icon carefully, um, the icon portrays a table. And where are you at the table? You're actually at the table. So the Last Supper isn't something that I, I, I look at and I watch and I remember. It's something I'm at. It's something I'm, I attend every single Sunday. And if you notice, every single icon of the Last Supper has the exact same characteristic, right? That you are actually at the table at the Last Supper and not just uh, uh, observing or remembering or you know, uh, fondly thinking about what happened that day. Uh, quickly on the theology side, we, we see the story of mankind. God created man in his image. Man commits sin, he's expelled from paradise. And God prepares man for the coming of his son. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. That's sort of what, what it, where it fits in and everything. This is the Old Testament preparation for, um, for, for the, the, the coming of Christ and the, and, the, and the Eucharist itself. And then Christ takes the form of a man. This is what, what Christ did. He unites us with himself and returns us to the Father. And this is where the Eucharist comes in, right? So it's like he comes down, he unites us with himself, and then he takes us back up, right? That uniting us with himself, with Christ, so that we participate and have everything, a portion and inheritance of Christ's becomes ours, right? Whatever, whatever God the Father gave to Christ, the Son, as, as adopted 
parts of his body. We, we inherit all of the same things, right? He, he takes us all in and he says, okay, they're with me, right? And everything you've promised to me, you promised to them, right? So this uniting is the Eucharist. And then he takes us back up with him uh, in the ascension. So the Christian liturgy grew out of Jewish worship, and there's no doubt about that. Father Alexander Schmemann says he's one of the eminent theologians on the liturgy and the Eucharist that we've talked about many times. He says, no one studying the pre-Christian forms of Hebrew worship can fail to notice the similarity of atmosphere or fail to see that both are cast in the same form. Right, so introduction to his book, uh, Liturgical Theology. Right, so it's basically, he's saying you, you, you can't help but notice that the structure is very, very similar. Right, there's a structural dependence. We bless in the name of God. We praise, confession of sins, intercession, glorifying God in history. This is normal structure in the synagogue. Right, so when I say blessing the name of God, praise, confession of sins, intercession, you'd think that's, we're talking about the liturgy. No, that's the, the synagogue prayers. In fact, the word, the word Eucharist means all of these things, it means thanks, praise, glorify, venerate. And we talked about this in the very first talk. Those same elements make up early Christian prayers as well. Jewish, Jews had a very, a very constant cycle of prayer and feasts. They had a daily cycle and a weekly cycle and a monthly cycle, although it was a lunar month and an annual cycle, right? So they, so just like we have these cycles in the Orthodox Church, they, the Jewish tradition had the, a very similar structure, right? This, these idea of cycles. And so um, the early Christian communities continued and preserved this traditional form of synagogue worship. Um, and this is what people were accustomed to, right? They didn't come and just abandon everything and say, we're throwing it all out and we're getting rid of all kinds of structure, right? But they continued, right? In Acts 3, one it says, Peter and John were going to the temple uh, because it was the hour of prayer, and Paul hastened to return to Jerusalem by Pentecost. So you see that the Jews still continued to to participate in in Jewish worship, right? This this idea of a cycle, this idea of structure, um, was was still very important. And it's not like they came and said, "Well, we've got Jesus now; all this stuff is garbage, and we're getting rid of it," right? Um, uh, and 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 you know th this is important because sometimes some of the Protestant groups uh, you know claim that early Christian worship was charismatic and in nature and that all the structure stuff was added later right so it was the Catholics that did it right it's the the Orthodox and the Catholics they came in they made it really complex and they added all this structure and all this stuff but the early Christians there man they're just you know loving Jesus you know and, and just hands in the air a lot of charisma it was all charismatic it was all free flowing. Um, but that's actually just not true, right? That we, we know from the earliest, you know, texts that the, that the structure of of the Jewish of Jewish synagogue worship continued, and that the 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 liturgy, the Christians sort of morphed and took over this this structure. And why is this important? Because Jewish practices were revealed and taught by God. I mean, the Jews didn't just make this stuff up. They're not just bad people. Right? God taught them to do these things. Right? The sacrifices were taught to them by God, right? So, and so Christianity is not something new and different, right? They didn't see themselves as converts from Jews, right? They, but they see themselves as a continuation of the Jewish faith, but an ultimate perfection of this, of the true religion, right? That, that God did pick the people of Israel as, as his people and the, his chosen people. And, the, and he revealed to them many, many things, right? But that Christ came and perfected all of this, right? And Christ said, I did not come to abolish the law but to perfect it, right? This is exactly Christ's words. So it shows that the early Christians wanted to maintain the spirit in which people were accustomed to praying, right? And that then the spirit was given to us by God. Structure is given to us by God. And that the early Christians weren't some charismatic group, uh, but rather followed uh, in these footsteps. So our Orthodox view of the Old Testament, you know, we look at the Bible, the Old and the New Testament as one unit, right? The church invites us to look in the Old Testament for the prefiguration of the New Testament and the sacraments, right? So we don't, we don't necessarily view the, the Old Testament stories as spiritual stories. You, you know, when, when we look at David, we see a type of Christ. When we see Joseph thrown into uh, the, the, the pit and coming out alive, we see a, 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 a type of, of the resurrection. We don't just see spiritual well you said joseph was a really great guy and moses was really patient david was really cool right but rather we see in them the the foreshadowing of of all of christ's ministry in his life uh theodore mopsustia says uh the events of the old were figures of the new the law of moses is the shadow 
but grace is the body. When the Egyptians pursued the Hebrews, they, having crossed the Red Sea, escaped from their tyranny. The sea is the figure of the baptismal pool. And we talk about this a lot in Tazbeha, uh, in, the, in the praise, in the midnight praise, when we talk about the horse and the rider, and they went into the sea, but the, cha- you know, the horse and the rider were stuck into the sea. And we talk about this, this, this exodus a lot. And people are like, why are we talking about Exodus so much, right? Because it's, it's the story of us conquering Satan through baptism, right? That we, when we become a part of the body of Christ through baptism, we conquer the tyranny of the devil. Um, the sea is the figure of the baptismal pool, and the cloud of the spirit, Moses of Christ the Savior, his staff of the cross, Pharaoh of the devil, the Egyptians of the demons, the manna of the divine food, the Eucharist. The water from the rock is the blood of the Savior. Indeed, as those men, so you see how every part of the story of of the escape of the Israelites from Egypt isn't just a story about the escape of them, right? It's, it's, it's It's prefiguring something in the New Testament. Indeed, as those men, having first crossed the Red Sea, then tasted a divine nourishment and a miraculous spring, so we, after baptism of salvation, participate in the divine mysteries. And what he's basically saying here is, you notice that they ate the manna after they went through uh, the Red Sea. And we eat the manna, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute, the Eucharist after we get baptized, right? In the same way, we don't eat, we don't take the Eucharist until we're baptized. And so it's very much the same way. So this is a really cool icon with all lots of Old Testament types on it. Um, I'll let you stare at it for a second. Um, and basically, the, 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 this icon, you know, try to Im, Im, embody every, uh, most, a lot of Old Testament types. And I'll go through this particular icon in, in, in a lot of detail, uh, all of the different types that are here. Um, and maybe we can go through and, uh, and put it all together in this talk. So the three major symbols I want to talk about, and then I'm going to talk about a few others. I want to go through the rest of that icon. Uh, is the first is the Pascha meal, uh, of, or the Passover, right? And this is the last strike against Pharaoh. You know about the ten plagues against Pharaoh. The last one was the Passover. Uh, the men in the wilderness, when when the Egyptian the Israelites didn't have any food in the wilderness, um, it kept the people of Israel from starving. Right? Every day they would have find men that they would find this bread-like substance on the ground, and they would collect it. And they would eat it, and that was their daily bread. And finally, the last uh, symbol, the major symbol I'll talk about is Melchizedek, uh, the priest. Uh, this is an interesting encounter between Abraham, the, our father Abraham, and uh, this king in the Old Testament. So we'll talk about those three things. So first thing, what is the Pesca? Uh, I'm sure you all know, but uh, God killed the firstborn of every Egyptian as the 10th pl- plague, right? He did the frogs and the locusts and the and the, you know, turn the Nile into blood and darkness and boils and all the things, right? And then finally, the last plague was this, this he killed the firstborn, whether it be animal or, 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 or human. Uh, but the Hebrews were saved, interestingly, by putting the blood of a lamb on their doorposts. So he, he told them to take the lamb, he told them to cook it a certain way, and take the blood of that lamb and put it on their doorpost. So, what, and, and, and if you have this sign on your doorpost, you were saved from this angel of death. Uh, so the death of the lamb saved God's people, right? So he said, kill a lamb, and if you kill the lamb, uh, it'll, 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 save, it'll save you. So why did God do this? So it's a very interesting thing. I mean, I'm sure he knows who the Israelites were, right? I mean, he could have just said, I will spare my people, and we all went, okay, that sounds good. And, you know, you, you don't need an ID card to, to know who did it. Right. But yet he said, no, you have to take this lamb. You have to kill the Passover. You have to do it the way I asked. Then take the blood and put on the door. And whoever, whoever has his blood on the door won't be uh, killed. And so the question is, what did the lamb do? Right. That's the question. And we know the lamb did nothing. Right. In fact, they, he said, get a good lamb, a, a, you know, one without blemish. Right. Don't get a, like a lame lamb with like, you know, three legs or, you know, has skin disease. No, no. I want you to kill the best lamb. Right, the perfect, the best one in your in your whole flock, right? And what did the lamb do to deserve this? Why did the lamb have to die? The lamb was innocent, right? And so, at some level, right, the lamb died so that the Israelites could live. The lamb sacrificed itself for the Israelites, although the lamb did nothing wrong, right? And this is the cross, isn't it? In fact, what did Saint John the Baptist say the first time he saw Christ? What was his exact words? I'll wait so I can hear you say it. Say it with me. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Right? He called him a lamb. 
and you're like, why would you call this guy a lamb? And he's, he's trying to get our minds to think, right? What's this lamb? Ah, it's the Pesca. It's the lamb that died. Its blood was spilt. And so that people were saved, right? What did Isaiah say? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Right, and this is the, the famous chapter in Isaiah, the suffering servant. Right, and it's a very long and beautiful, uh, beautiful chapter that we read during Holy Week. And so, these this is the prophecy that Christ is this Lamb that comes and takes away the sins of the world. So the fathers tell us, Saint John Chrysostom says, why is it that he instituted this sacrament at the time of the Passover? Now, if you remember, the Eucharist, the liturgy, for, was instituted right after the Passover. So the first thing we do is we do Passover. And after Jesus was done with the Passover, he said, okay, let's put away all the Passover stuff. Let's take out bread and wine. And now I'm going to give you my body and my blood. And St. John Chrysostom says that you might learn in every way that he is also the lawgiver of the old covenant and that the things in it were foreshadowing of these. Therefore, where the type is there, he puts the truth. So he puts the, the, the Eucharist right next to the Passover because he wanted to tell you, I'm the Passover. I'm this new Passover, right? I'm replacing the old Passover. You know, that lamb that died, that's me. This is my blood now. Okay. And we even say this in the Gbeya, let us sing with the angels saying, uh, let us sing with the angels saying, O Lord God, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us, right? This is what we say every, every time in the Gbeya. So we call Christ the Lamb. St. Cyril of Jerusalem has this beautiful quote. He says, God sent Moses to free them from the slavery of the Egyptians. The doorposts were anointed with the blood of the lamb so that the destroyer might pass over the houses that had the sign of the blood. Let us go from the figure to the reality. There we have Moses sent by God into Egypt. Here we have Christ sent by the father into the world. There the task is to free the oppressed people from Egypt here to rescue men tyrannized in the world by sin. There the blood of the lamb wards off the destroyer here, the blood of the true lamb, Jesus Christ, puts the demons to flight, right? So a beautiful juxtaposition of, 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 of Moses and this whole story and Christ and, and the story of salvation. So we, again, don't look at Moses as some story of a really great guy who walked around the desert for a really long time, um, but rather that he's this type of Christ and that everything in this story of, of tyranny and then freedom uh, relates to the story of the Eucharist and Christ in us. And, and something that's very interesting that I just learned, the Passover was actually cooked on two sticks uh, in the shape of a cross. So when you cook the Passover, one of the instructions of God was that. Um, uh, da, 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 da. So uh, let's see if you can find, see my, the Paschal lamb seems to have been roasted in the form of a cross. This lamb, which was, which was to be roasted whole, whole, was a symbol of the punishment of the cross, which was inflicted on Christ. For the lamb which was roasted was so placed as to resemble the figure of a cross. With one spit, it was pierced longitudinally from the tail to the head. With another, it was transfixed through the shoulders so that the four legs became, etc., etc. So the, the instructions of God were to make the sign of the cross as you put the lamb, the lamb through. So even the lamb was cooked uh, on, on the shape of a cross, something I did not know. Right, so that's the first uh, type is the, the Passover. The second type we're going to talk over about is the manna from heaven. So we know this story from the book of Exodus. God sent the Hebrews uh, bread-like substance that they collected daily. I have lots of typos in my slides. Um, Christ helps us this, understand this more deeply in John 6, 26 and through 59, right? Where he says, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead, right? But I am the true bread of life that comes down from heaven. He so, ever, he, who's, he so eats from me shall never hunger, and he so eat, that eats from my flesh will never thirst, right? So, and we talked a lot about this in the very first talk on the institution, right? He, he, he made this comparison a lot, right? Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. And the reason he did this is manna was a big deal to the Jews, right? This miracle was amazing, right? Because you have about 2 million Jews, right? Walking through Sinai for 40 years. Now, if, if you've been in Sinai, you know nothing grows there, right? And if you've driven through there, going to Sharm Sheikh or any of these places, it is a desolate nothingness, right? For, for, for two million people to survive in those conditions, I mean, even if they had animals, their animals would be dead 
very quickly. You can't grow crops. You can't grow anything, right? So the fact that they all survived for 40 years is, 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 is the Jews' biggest, you know, biggest you know, claim to fame, right? They, they're like, our fathers ate men in the wilderness, right? What did you ever do? You know, like we're the Jews, you know, we know we're right because God kept us alive and sent this bread like substance, right? So every morning they would collect their bread like substance, right? Until they reached the promised land. Okay? And interestingly, you know, they would only collect it six days a week. And on, on Friday, they would collect two days worth, right? Because on Saturday was the Sabbath and they weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath. So on Friday, they would collect two days worth. And the only time that it would not spoil would be on Fridays. And so this miracle would recur every single Friday, right? Because some people would try to collect a little bit more. They're like, well, I don't know. It's, you know, Tuesday. I don't know if this is going to be around on Wednesday. Let's just collect extra. Well, whatever extra they collected would go bad. It always went bad, right? And the only, t and, and so several people tried this, of course, and it would go bad. And then finally they figured out it's not going to happen. But the only day it wouldn't go bad was Friday. They could collect extra on Friday for Saturday and it wouldn't go bad. And this happened every single Friday, right? Uh, and again, like as we pointed out earlier, they only ate it after they crossed the Red Sea, right? The manna. So this manna becomes their daily bread, this sustenance until they go to heaven, until they enter the promised land. It kept them alive. And here we have on this icon, this is the icon of Moses. And these are the people collecting uh, their daily bread, right? So you can see, you know, a bunch of tents. This is all the people of Israel out in the middle of, of Sinai. Uh, and they're, they're out there collecting every single day. They're the, the men. Um, now, if you look at the icon above it, uh, I, I wanted to kind of point this one out too. So those are the, that's the, the second type, but I wanted to point out this icon while I'm here. This is the, the icon of uh, Isaiah, his lips being touched by a coal. So the, from Isaiah, it says, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. So he took the coal from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth. Okay, so now you've taken this live coal You've touched someone's mouth with it. It came from the altar. And you say, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sins atoned for. So the touching from the altar of this live hot coal, right, atoned his sins and took away his guilt. Right? So and many times when you go to many, many churches, you'll find this particular icon somewhere on the iconostasis, right? And sometimes it'll be over one of the doors or on the side or something like that. But a lot of times they'll put this icon of Isaiah having his mouth touched by a fiery coal by the seraphim um, as, a, as a type of Christ. I just wanted to throw that in there since the icon was there. So the third type we'll talk about is Melchizedek. Melchizedek, sorry, I should say it the, the American way. So the book of Genesis, it says, after Abram, Abraham, uh, returned from defeating King Karla Dorlamer, and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God, most high, and be blessed. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by most high God, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God, most high, who delivered your enemies into your hands. Now, the reason this story is so interesting is that in the times of Abraham, they didn't offer live sacrifice. They didn't offer sacrifice of bread and wine. They offered live sacrifices. Even, even Cain and Abel knew this. Noah knew this, right? From the very earliest times, the sacrifice was always offered as, a, as an animal, a live animal, right? And all of a sudden, there's this weird part in, in, in Genesis where this guy named Melchizedek comes out. He's the king of Salem, Salem, king of peace, and he brings out bread and wine, and in no place in the Old Testament does anyone ever come out with bread and wine. It's kind of this very unique one-off thing, right? And so um, it, the name Melchizedek is translated as my king is righteousness. So the name Melchizedek is my king is righteousness. And he's introduced as the king of peace and the priest of God most high. So we see in this Melchizedek story, we see the Eucharist and we see Christ. Right? We see not just a story about Abram coming back from some war and some random guy coming out offering bread and wine, but we see something in it much more. So this is Melchizedek, as you can see this icon he's holding. Uh, it's his priest and king of Salam. 
Uh, he's holding bread and wine. Our priesthood, in fact, we say is the priesthood of Melchizedek. And that's why when one of the patriarchs uh, comes, we, we say a hymn right before the gospel. We'll say, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Right? Because our priesthood is not a Levitical priesthood, which ended when the high priest rent his clothes. Okay? Our priesthood, we say we are the priesthood of Melchizedek. So we don't follow the Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament. The, the Levites were... Uh, was were one of the 12 tribes. They were the, the tribes of priests only. Okay, And we say that the Levitical priesthood ended when this high priest went re-rent his clothes in the, in the presence of Christ. He ripped his clothes down the middle. And this was a symbol of, you know, when he hears blasphemy, that's what he's supposed to do. And that's when we say this Levitical priesthood ended. And by the way, this is why uh, in our Tonyas, in, in, uh, in when, when a deacon dresses in, as a Tonya, his, the opening of the tonya isn't down the middle. If you notice, the openings are always on the shoulders. Just is kind of weird. Like, why would you, why wouldn't you just, like any shirt, open it down the middle? And then you can put your head in and out easily and then you zip it up. And, and the reason is because that tonya is a symbol of priesthood. And our priesthood is not torn down the middle like the Levitical priesthood. When that priest rent his clothes, his his tunic down the middle. So we don't rent ours down the middle. And so we will slit them on the shoulders uh, just to show that, you know, we're not part of that old priesthood. We're part of the Melchizedek priesthood, right? So a little fun fact uh, for you. Uh, his offering is un considered universally accepted because the Jews were only allowed to make offering in Jerusalem. So that's very interesting, right? Again, he's making an offering, but the Jews at the time only could offer in Jerusalem. But Malachi announced it as a characteristic of the kingdom of come to kingdom the kingdom to come. That sacrifice will be offered in all places. And the sacrifice of Malchizedek was not, not limited to one place. It could be offered everywhere, right? So, because he came out not in Jerusalem and offered this sacrifice. Okay, so this is the icon of Malchizedek and Abraham. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, um, that's part of this, this icon. Uh, Saint uh, Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, one of my one of my favorite uh, saints. He he writes he writes extensively, and he's really a, a, an amazing scholar. He said, "Then he came as a vicar, as a victor. Sorry, Melchizedek, the priest, went to meet him, and offered bread. He, uh, being Abram, came as a victor. Melchizedek, the priest, went to meet him, and offered bread and wine. Who had the bread and wine? Abraham did not have it, but who did have it? Melchizedek." He then is the author of the sacraments. So he's saying, where did the bread and wine come from? Nobody comes out with bread and wine to offer a sacrifice, right? When you had a victory and you wanted to thank God, you offered a bloody sacrifice. He then is the author of the sacraments. Who is Melchizedek? Who is described as the king of righteousness, the king of peace? Again, in Hebrews, uh, St. Paul talks a lot about this. Who then is the king of righteousness other than the righteousness of God? Who is the king of peace, the wisdom of God? He who was able to say, my peace, I give to you. My peace, I leave with you. He continues. So first understand that these sacraments which you receive are earlier than whatever sacraments the Jews say they have. And that the Christian people began before the people of the Jews began. So he's even saying, you know, the, the, the Old Testament sacrifices that came from Moses and all of these things and the, and, the, and the five types of sacrifices. He's like, this, our sacrifice of the Eucharist predates the, 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 the mosaic even uh, sacrifices. But we in predestination, they in name. Melchizedek then offered bread and wine. Who is Melchizedek? Without father, it says, and without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. And this is what it says in Hebrew about him. This is what the epistle of the Hebrew has. Without father, it says, and without mother. So this, this guy, Melchizedek, you know, the, the gospel elaborates about him. He's a man without father and without mother. There you have one likened to the son of God. The son of God was born by heavenly generation without mother because he was born of God, the father alone. And again, he was born without father when he was born of the virgin. For he was not begotten of the seed of man, but was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, brought forth from a virginal womb. Melchizedek was also a priest in all respects. And it says, likened to the son of God. For Christ, too, is a priest, and we say that Christ is the, the, the chief priest, um, is, is a priest to whom is said, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Therefore, who is the author of the sacraments but the Lord Jesus? These sacraments came down from heaven, for all counsel is from heaven. So he's saying that this priest himself 
was Christ, was a, was a type of Christ, or maybe was Christ, you know, Lord only knows, right? But that he came as the author of these sacraments, as this king of peace, and, and offered these things uh, for us to see. And if you noticed up here, there was this uh, icon above it of Ezekiel, of, of someone eating a scroll. And so very quickly, uh, this is Ezekiel eating the scroll, the word of God. Uh, and so from the book of Ezekiel, it says, and he said to me, son of man, eat what is before you, eat this scroll. So this is just kind of this weird dialogue in the Old Testament, right? Ezekiel is told to eat a scroll, right? Then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. Now what's the scroll? It's the word of God. So he's eating the word of God. And Christ is the Logos, the second person of the Trinity. And the Lord Logos means the word of God. So Christ is the word of God. Ezekiel is eating the scroll, which is the word of God. Then he said to me, son of man, eat this scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. So when we see again, the story of Ezekiel eating the scroll, we see this as a type of pre prefiguration of the Eucharist itself. And now the rest of the icon, I'll go through it very quickly. This is the story of Cain and Abel. And why is the story of Cain and Abel a type of the Eucharist? Right? Because Abel offers this sacrifice, this perfect sacrifice that is then given to God and God accepts it. And he doesn't accept the other sacrifice. Now, what's interesting about the story, and, and you think about the story of Cain and Abel, and you're like, you know, why are you being so mean, right? I mean, Cain is offering his first, you know, his first fruits of his labor, right? His work, his effort. He planted, he harvested, he, you know, grew these crops and he, and he offered the best crops that he had, right? And Abel comes and offers a, an animal, a sacrifice, right? And God accepts that sacrifice. And you're like, why is, you know, why is God being so picky, right? Well, it's not that, you know, that, you know, God likes animals over fruits and vegetables, Right. But rather, the fruits and vegetables represent my own labor, my own toil. Cable, Cain came and said, God, I'm going to offer to you my own work. Right. I'm, I'm going to offer a, a, a sacrifice for the forgiveness of my sins of my own labor. Right. I will put in my effort. Right. And 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 this will be my offering to you, my myself. Right. And then um, Abel comes along and offers the lamb, right? And so he's offering is someone else. He's offering another life. He's saying, take this other life as a sacrifice for me, right? And it's as if the sins can't be covered by my own efforts, but rather they get covered by someone else's dying for me, the skin of an animal, the lamb, Right. The same story in a different way happens with Adam and Eve. Right. Adam and Eve, when they sin, how do they cover their sin? With fig leaf. Right. They take it and they sow it themselves and they put in their work and their effort. And they say, I'm going to put in my effort and I'm going to cover my sins with my work. And then what did Christ do? He said he came. God came and he covered him with the skins of an animal. So Christ offered this sacrifice and said, this is how we cover sins, right? It has to be the skin of an animal, of something else dying for you, right? Again, the story of the Passover. Okay. And then moving quickly, this, what's this icon? This is not the Last Supper. I know you think that. It's a good guess. These are the two disciples at Imwes, right? And if you remember that story, there's two disciples. They walk with Christ. They don't know it's Christ. It's after the, after the crucifixion, before the resurrection. They're walking with him. He's talking. They have no idea who he is. And he's telling them about the Old Testament and the prophecies, and he's teaching them from the books. And then he stops and he breaks bread. And when he breaks bread, they recognize him and they see who he is. Right? And so, and by the way, our Eucharist, our liturgy is structured that exact same way. In the beginning of the liturgy, we have the liturgy of the word, which is the part where we, um, like Christ, teach first. So he taught them first. And then comes the Eucharist, the prayers, the, the liturgy of the, of, the, of the believers. And that part, he breaks bread and then we see him. So the two disciples in West are the, obviously the Eucharist. And then the story of Abraham uh, and Isaac, right, where he gives his only begotten son, right? And he offers his only begotten son, right? 
and of course this is a, a symbol of Christ and we talk a lot about this on, on Holy Thursday during the fraction and even in the readings before the fraction but during the fraction we, we, we talk about how Isaac carried the wood that he used to be sacrificed on just like Christ carried the cross that he was to be sacrificed on and, and all of these stories and, and just like Isaac returned alive and, you know when he should have been dead uh, Christ returned alive when he should have been dead and, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you want to look at the Catholic Mass, which, you know, it just saying this, this quote is really nice because it puts together all of these different symbols. He says, be pleased. It says, be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them. As once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant, Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your priest, high priest, Melchizedek, right? So if you, uh, wow, and uh, yeah. So if you, if, you, if you see two of those are right there in this particular icon. So in this icon, in this prayer, they put together Abel, and they put together Abraham, uh, the sacrifice of Abraham, and the sacrifice of Melchizedek. Uh, Abel was the son of Adam and Eve, a keeper of the flocks, a shepherd. He brought an offering to the Lord, one of the best firstlings of his flock, a choice lamb. The Lord looked with favor on Abel at his offering because he returned a portion of what God had given him and he offered the best of what he had. And if, in, in this icon, this basilica in Italy, uh, it's a really nice mosaic that I found. Uh, and you find in one icon the offering of Abel, offering his lamb offering of Melchizedek at the table, and you see bread and wine at the table. And then on the right there, you see Abraham uh, offering his son all in one icon, right? And they're all at the, the Eucharist. They're all at the table. And so this link of all three of these types uh, all in one. Okay, I think that's my last slide. Um, so um, thank you very much uh, for listening. And um, this is basically, you know, to summarize uh, the importance of the Old Testament and the links between the Old Testament and the New, New Testament. Uh, I know this was a kind of a dense talk, but uh, a very important one. And I think it, it helps enrich our experience and understanding that when we read the Bible, it's not just a group of randomly put together stories, uh, but rather there's a lot of, of significance and, and symbolism uh, in all the things that happen in the Old Testament. Uh, God bless you guys. Uh, one of these days we'll get out of quarantine and we'll, we'll, see, each, we'll see each other live, uh, I hope soon. All right. Glory be to God uh, forever. Amen.